Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the, sad to say, final panel uh, of Comic New York. Thank you. Easy. Um, my name is Jeremy Dauber, for those of you who don't know, and I am one of the co-organizers along with Danny Fingeroth and Karen Green of this event. And I wanted to start my introduction, my brief introduction, with a brief autobiographical moment, which is that my first encounter with scholarship really came in the pages of Marvel comic books. Uh, not about Marvel comic books, that is not, not academic scholarship about them, but the comic books themselves. Um, because they were, as many, for many of you this may be the case, my, your first encounter with a footnote. Right, they, we didn't, they didn't, were numbers, right, but they were these little asterisks and they referred back to some previous textual material on the issue. Uh, and I was very lucky that in the person of my uncle Zach, I had a repository, a library of earlier comics that I could assiduously go back and uh, discover the earlier material to which was referenced. Uh, it was also the time uh, in the letters pages where I found, uh, and you should forgive me as the, the director of the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies, the Talmudic level uh, <laughs> of complicated observation and attempted reconciliation that would go on among what we, we would call fans or scholars uh, who themselves were trying to write their own commentaries uh, on all of the textual material that was in front of them. So uh, that was my first, as I say, encounter with, with sort of comics and an academy uh, of readers and lovers and followers, uh, as well then as beginning to meet, being lucky enough in this position to meet many of the creators as we, and, and hear from them as we have over the last two days, to see, uh, as I became, account, uh, became involved with this, the tremendous amount of scholarship that goes into creating and producing and thinking about the works uh, themselves, whether it's uh, the research material that's gathered in order to write or the visual research material, the libraries in order to, um, in order to draw and provide reference material in that respect. Uh, and so it seemed uh, that uh, coming into the university in an age when comic studies was beginning to really uh, take hold for the first time in the academy, it seemed like a natural outgrowth of, of my own and so many other people's interests. And so as a result, I'm truly delighted uh, not only to be involved with this as an organizer, but to be chairing this panel as well. And I am particularly delighted to have a distinguished, intelligent, and good-looking panel um, <laughs> To, uh, to my left, and I would Wore like to tell you... your eyes out on the Talmud, did you? <laughs> <laughs> to tell you a little bit, and witty, tell you a little bit about them uh, each. And I am going to start with uh, the figure on my furthest left, and that is Chris Couch, who we owe a great debt to, not only for serving on this panel, but as Karen said yesterday in her introduction, providing the inspiration for having an event at Columbia to begin with. Uh, and this is in... So, yes, please. Chris himself is a son of Columbia, uh, it is fair to say. He holds a, a undergraduate, master's, and doctoral degrees in art history from this august institution and is a uh, prolific publisher of material, of articles, uh, not only on Latin American art but on comics uh, as well. Uh, and uh, they include, among other things, a work on uh, another distinguished uh, graduate of Columbia, Jerry Robinson, or an alumnus of Columbia, and uh, the Will Eisner companion. Um, and he has taught uh, comics as art and literature at the School of Visual Arts, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he is currently a visiting associate professor uh, in American Studies at Trinity University. Uh, coming uh, to his right is Jonathan Gray uh, at uh, John Jay College in CUNY, um, who works on a dazzling variety of subjects, including uh, post-World War II American literature and culture, African-American literature, comic books, black masculinity, race, and popular culture. His first book, Innocence by Association, Civil Rights, and the White Literary Imagination, will be published in the fall, and he's currently working on another project, the follow-up project on race and comic books. Um, he is a, a, a new friend, I think it's fair to say, but uh, and I, I'm following him on Twitter, as you all well should, because <laughs> he's been <laughs> tweeting regularly. Uh, so... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's TMI, but, uh, you know, maybe. And now uh, to my nearest left, Paul Levitz. Um, and I would say that Paul Levitz is probably best known as the winner of two best fanzine comic fan art awards. 
maybe, maybe not. Uh, he's probably best known as a, uh, the writer on uh, some of the Legion of Superheroes' most successful uh, runs in, it, in its long and distinguished history. Uh, the trade collected edition, uh, the Great Darkness Saga, was a New York Times bestseller. And his recent monumental book, and I mean this in every sense, it weighs about 15 or 20 pounds, <laughs> from Toshin, uh, the 75 years of DC Comics, The Art of Modern Mythmaking, recently won an Eisner Award. Um, my personal uh, favorite part about Paul Levitz's resume is that he is now teaching at Columbia University, uh, a seminar in American Studies, and he and I will be teaching what I believe is the first course on the American graphic novel uh, next year uh, at, at, at Columbia. So please welcome all of our panel. And uh, I wanted to begin by uh, just thinking about this panel in the way that we think about the multiplicity of tasks that take place uh, among people in the academy. And that is that we are, among other things, we are teachers, we teach undergraduates, uh, we teach and train graduate students, we do research of our own, right, and, and, and teach these graduate students how to do research. And then in some sense, along with another part of the university, another part which is the libraries, we help to serve as custodians uh, of this material as well. We preserve it, we collect it, we put it in order, an organized order that makes sense. And so I wanted to take the panel and get their observations and insights about each of these different areas uh, serially. And so um, the first question that I'm going to throw out is about, as I say, teaching. And, um, and since this is a panel not on comics in general, but about Comic New York in specific, I want to ask when you guys are thinking about how you're teaching courses, how you're arranging your, your courses, um, and you're introducing maybe to people comics in general, where does New York figure in your courses, how do you use this to think about comics as a whole and, and about New York uh, and its place in comics? And I'll start with Chris, if, if you don't mind. Chris, please start us off. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think about in terms of comics in the academy is where do comics fit in terms of discipline? Oh, oh is it too loud? No. Oh, oh I need Not it loud enough. closer. <laughs> okay, one of the things I think about with comics and where it fits is what discipline do comics fit in? Should it be English? Should it be art history? Um, <clears throat> in my own career, uh, the first time I was hired to teach comics, um, was at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and I was hired into the Department of uh, Comparative Literature. Um, and the chair who hired me at that time, Bill Mabius, said that he had incorporated children's literature into the comparative literature program because his 12-year-old daughter had said to him, Dad, why don't you teach the books I care about? Okay, <laughs> so I met him uh, at a panel at Words and Pictures Museum in Northampton, and, and he said, I've been looking for someone like you, because I was an editor at Kitchen Sink Press, but I had my PhD in art history from Columbia. He said, I've incorporated children's literature. This was uh, 1996. I want comics in comparative literature, and so I started teaching one class a semester in comics um, at UMass, uh, and I've been uh, doing that since then, uh, teaching comics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in comparative literature. Um, when I got the chance to teach at Trinity, um, I was hired by Paul Lauder, who's a monument in American studies. Um, he began his career as a, a, an undergraduate in college, as a member of a, th a, a, a thing called the SDS, which you might have heard of, Students <laughs> for the Democratic Society, um, and he's been involved with alternative education and radical education initiatives for his entire life, and he hired me to teach comics um, at Trinity, Uni Trinity College in Hartford, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased to do that, and then I also want to thank Rebecca Gay for connecting me with Marshall Arisman to teach history of comics in the graduate program in, in, in illustration um, at the School of Visual Arts. And when Marshall Arisman hired me, he said to me, look, when I went to school, we knew what the hierarchies were. You know, that, you know, architecture was at the top, painting and sculpture was there, illustration was here, and comics, they, were, they didn't even count. And he said, our students now do not internalize those hierarchies. They believe these are all arts, and they need to know about the history of comics. So um, I find that comics are something that really crosses disciplinary boundaries, um, but that the disciplines that are the most open to comics are the ones that uh, are really open to world literatures um, and to radical perspectives. And I think that goes back to what the talk about comics as a democratic medium yesterday that came up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, when I teach comics, um, my basic comic is a cor comics course is a history of comics from the yellow kid to mouse. 
um, and that's a very New York-centered course, okay? Um, I teach The Yellow Kid as the first comic strip um, because it was the first strip to appear in a newspaper, and it was invented in the New York of vaudeville and Giddish theater and things like that, and, and just was a huge cultural phenomenon. Um, I was actually reading Edmund Wilson's The Twenties a year or so ago, um, and in there there's an anecdote from the 1920s about a socialite sleeping with a boxer, and to make fun of him, Edmund Wilson says, oh, he reads the comics, The Yellow Kid, and all that. And this is in the 1920s, and the comics were still The Yellow Kid. Um, and then, of course, we do, you know, uh, superheroes, EC Comics, it's all about New York. You know, comics were first invented in New York by the Eastern Color Printing Salesman in the 30s. Comic books didn't exist before that. And then, of course, Will Eisner is, you know, the father of the graphic novel. So it's a very New York-centered course. Um, and I, I think the students really appreciate that, the, you know, ethnic diversity, the, the creativity, sometimes the marginality of the Jewish creators. I also teach a class in Judaic studies on uh, the history of the Jewish graphic novel at the University of Massachusetts, which is funded by uh, the Posen Foundation for Jewish Secularism, and I'm very pleased to do that. Thank you. Jonathan. Um, yeah, so for me, I, I begin sort of with myself. Um, the reason, one of the things, one of the tools that I used to, to, to become literate um, was comic books, right? And so um, when I began, you know, an English degree and, 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 and then eventually a PhD in English, I kept the, the things I would learn, you know, about, you know, rhizomes and deconstruction and, and, and all of these things. I'm like, well, wait, this is happening here. Right, and so um, a lot of these, you know, just sort of by working through analog, I was able to, to sort of better understand literary theory and, you know, sort of the scope of literature through my earlier childhood experience with comics. Um, and so what I find um, at CUNY when I teach comics is um, people are, one, incredibly enthused to finally be able to, you know, work with something that actually, this, we can do this here, right? And, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's incredibly exciting for them. Um, and, and then it's, 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 it's an easy way into literary theory and into some of the things that are important to me, right? Um, and so, of course, um, I am, you know, so, sorry to Paul, but I, I was sort of raised on Marvel Comics. Um, but, and, 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 and we talk about this, and in fact, in my, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on a, on a book um, on race and comics, and I was just, I'm just have a draft of, of the Luke Cage chapter. Um, and thinking about Luke Cage's debut in 1972 in light of Attica and in light of the death of George Jackson, right? Um, and, so the, and so because Marvel Comics were, were placed in the real world, um, it's, it's so much easier to, to sort of make these connections than it is if you're talking about Opal City or Stars. Where is Star City exactly? Right? Um, and so, you know, so for me teaching this, this course, um, I don't go that far back. I actually start in the 1960s and move forward. That's, you know, I'm, I'm a post-World War II scholar. Um, but I am able to, to, to tie in so much of American culture. And it's all, it's all there. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Paul. It's all there. It's all embedded in, in the text itself if you know how to look and where to look. So um, that's how it goes. Right. OK. Um, it's a New York story. You know, my uh, grandfather worked in a newsstand on the Lower East Side in the Depression years. I like to imagine that he might have sold some of those first prototype comic books, or he might have been the one that Max Gaines walked past with <laughs> the ones with a 10 cent sticker on them uh, and stuffed them in. Uh, he did that because there was no work for tailors or whatever the male equivalent of seamstress was in the sweatshops in the Depression years, so he had lost his natural employment, so he was working 16 hours in that. Um, the newspaper comics were born here in the circulation wars. The comic books were born here, Eastern Color, um, DC off the press of the Brooklyn Eagle at the bottom of Fulton Street. Um, the generation that led the business of comics came into comics here as immigrants off the boat because LaGuardia ran an anti-porn campaign that drove them out of the stuff they were selling up to the next highest rung on the, on the ladder and one inch above <laughs> porn and pulps was comic books. <laughs> Some really little steps on that ladder. Um, and the vast majority of the early great comic book creators were kids on the streets of New York. 
um, whether they went straight into comics or whether they went through the Fleischer Animation Studios, which were here peculiarly in those days, and one of the great breeding grounds of talent for them. So it all started here, and it really isn't until you get to about 1981 or 1982 that you begin to have the story splinter out across the rest of the country. You had little bits with the underground comics and the excitement that that was causing, but there were no regularly producing comic book publishers to go to work for outside New York uh, until First and Pacific, about 1980 or so. Um, so it's we had a lot of time to incubate this field and make that happen. And if you're telling the history of comics, you're telling a New York story. We'll leave aside all the material that goes inside the pages and inside the fiction, whether it was cunningly disguised as Gotham and Metropolis. I don't think that was that hard to figure out, John. <laughs> um, or... <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, they get confused out there. Um, but the, the, it's a New York story at the end of the day. One of the things that's come out already in the answers that you're seeing is the tremendous number of, if you're thinking like a, a, an academic bureaucrat as I sometimes am, the tremendous number of disciplines and departments and centers and possibilities that, that comics could act in. It could be in art history or English. Or, 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 his, or, or history, what are some of, this is a two-part question or two different kinds of questions, what are the kinds of disciplines that you guys feel most comfortable doing research in and how does your comics research change by the fact that uh, you have to, in some sense, listen to the tools of a, di of a particular discipline? Right. Uh, and also, and I'd be interested, there are going to be as many answers probably as there are people who think about this, but what is the greatest area of scholarly lack that research has to be done in in comics. That is, if you had one area, a graduate student came to you and said, I could work on anything in the world in comics, what's the area that's needed the most? Um, and you could answer either or both of these questions. And, and I'm, I'm looking at Jonathan, so I'm going to look, I'm going to ask you first. That's fine. Um, well, sitting in the audience is one of my graduate students who is doing a, a dissertation on, on women's comics. Um, so um, I will plug both my project and hers. I think that um, while we have a great understanding of the way that particularly Jewish identity, um, you know, uh, plays out inside the medium of comics, both from, 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 from a business standpoint and from the standpoint of, of some of the characters, um, looking at issues of, of race and gender, um, there's, there's, there's sort of a lot less work done there, mm -hmm. right? And so um, I think that, you know, I mean, I'm working on a book on race and, and comics. She's working on a dissertation that's going to incorporate, you know, sort of women's comics and, 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 and how that, that grows and, and evolves. And I think that, um, if you, th that those will be two areas where one could do work. Um, and if to, just, to, just to step back, it's funny, I also, I'm, I'm advising, I'm on a dissertation committee in art history even though I have a PhD in American studies, in part because the person doing the dissertation is writing his dissertation on alternative comics. Um, and no one in the art history department at the CUNY Grad Center knows anything about comics at all. Right. <laughs> and so they're looking around, well, who inside CUNY knows something? I do, right? Um, you know, so Chris, getting back to what you were saying yesterday about just raising your hand when people want things done, sure, I can, I can be on that committee. Um, and so, um, of course, I'm not comfortable inside art history. I wasn't trained as an art historian. Um, and so, but, and so but, but I think the, the place where these things all overlap is in cultural studies, right? right? Cultural studies is, is what allows you to sort of, you know, gesture towards history, gesture towards literature, gesture towards art history, gesture towards sociology and, polit and, and, and political science, and, and, and also towards the law as well, right? Because, I mean, what does it mean um, that, you know, if you guys are following sort, sort of contemporary comics, right? You know, where the discussion is about the Patriot Act. Right? I mean, if you look at like the Avengers, you know, the so-called Civil War and the Avengers, this is all, you know, just an allegory of the Patriot Act, right? I mean, and so there's a way in which um, locating um, comic studies inside co in interdisciplinary cultural studies allows you to branch out into all these different areas. Great. And I'm going to turn from uh, someone who's come up in an interdisciplinary approach, American studies and cultural studies, to someone who came out of a disciplinary uh, right. approach, uh, that is Chris, who came out through art, art history but it has now branched down to a wide variety of, of, of areas. So Chris, what, what's your take on this question? 
Well, um, I, I want to talk about what, what research needs to be done in comics first. And uh, actually, I would kind of answer that as like everything. Well, um, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> More of everything, yes, that's well, true. Well, um, when I think of comic studies today, I, I compare it not to like, you know, contemporary film or anything like that, but um, 19th century classical studies, okay, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, in the 1800s, 1700s, but really in the 1800s, um, modern scholarship, enlightenment-based scholarship was turning its attention to the text from the classical world and establishing them for the first time. And I think that's something that we haven't done in comics at all, which is establish our texts. I mean, what we have is like the comic book price guide, you know? Wow. Uh, okay, and, and uh, the fans have done very important things, but I think that we're in the position of 19th century classical philology, and we have to establish what our texts are, and, and we need to read them, okay? Um, I went to a, a book history conference two years ago, and Michael Suarez, who's the head of the Rare Book School at UVA, University of Virginia, said, um, one of his teachers said, in order to understand early printed books, you have to handle 5,000 of them. And I would say to scholars coming up these days, in order to understand comic books and graphic novels, you have to read at least 5,000 of them, okay? Not just sit down and read two graphic novels and think you can write a dissertation on it. You have to read <laughs> in the depths of the field. Right. We don't know what was in all the Atlas comics that Stan Lee edited and Jerry Robinson drew so many stories for. You know, um, people in graduate school now today have not read all the work by Will Eisner that was published. We have to establish our text, and I think we are really in the 19th century in terms of scholarship and comics, and we have a long way to go. And I want to say the person who has really been the pioneer in this and who is really establishing um, the data in the field is John Lent, um, who is the editor of the International Journal of Comic Art, which many, many mm -hmm. people here have published in. And that is truly an international journal. John um, encourages young scholars from all around the world, especially Asia, but including Eastern Europe, to document the works in their cultural traditions and to publish them in International Journal of Comic Art. Mm -hmm. um, and he is really um, a font of knowledge. He's got the most extensive personal archives on comics that I've ever seen anywhere. And I think that's really important. Um, another program that I think is really important and needs to be acknowledged is Ohio State, but even before Ohio State is Mr. Bill Blackbeard, whose name we should all genuflect before, the man who saved the comics, um, because you know what? Uh, <laughs> Bill Blackbeard, the man who saved the comics, the San Francisco Academy of Comic Art now housed at Ohio State University, mm -hmm. because a microfilm of a comic strip is not a comic strip. A piece of original art of a comic strip is not a comic strip. A printed color Sunday comic strip is a comic strip, and we would not have most of those without Mr. Bill Blackbeard mm -hmm. and the archive that the librarian Lucy Caswell bought and housed at Ohio State. Um, and her uh, successor, Jenny Robb, are two of the major people who are putting scholarship on a professional basis. And I think that Columbia is now playing a role in that, and I am so proud that my alma mater is taking a stand and helping create an archive for comics, so. <laughs> I'm gonna clap for that. <laughs> um, and we will get back to questions of preservation in archives, which you've touched on as a central part of this uh, a little bit later in our conversation. Uh, but, but following on the first part of what you were saying, Chris, I wanna turn to Paul, you know, someone who really has spent decades in the field of this, and has real intimate familiarity with a lot of this, and now is coming to the field of scholarship. I think one can say that the 75 years of DC book was a work of real research and scholarship. Uh, what's your take now coming into this side of the field from this other side, really having done some of the work that Chris was referring to? Well, uh, I mean, I have to first job. advertise that I'm a faux academic. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's be serious here. There's six degrees on that side of the table and there's none over here. Um, the, the DC book represents something I have deep knowledge of, but it's not the same as diving in as an outside scholar and researching something impartially to figure it out, which is a whole other art form. I hope to exhibit some of those behaviors in the remainder of my writing days and live up to that standard, um, but I haven't, I haven't made that one yet. I support everything that was said. I'd identify a couple of things that I think should be very high order that one that was sort of touched on sideways and but it should be hit dead center and another that was not touched on which is I think one of the things that makes this radically different than the 19th century literature for a moment. Um, the thing that was touched on that I'd go a little more strongly on is that the existing body of comic scholarship before the scholars got into it was driven almost entirely by the kinds of comics I love, the superhero comics. You can 
find online fairly easily three people's guess about who inked an issue of X-Men <laughs> uh, that wasn't credited and an articulate debate about how that happened. You can't find who wrote all the romance comics. Mm. You can't mm. find a word about major artists in that field, J. Mm. Scott Pike, Artie Saff, guys who did that for years and years with enormous audiences. Um, that's true as well for some of the young children's comics that were done. And I think there's an enormous body of research to be done there, both in who the creators were and what the ethos of that material was and how people responded to them uh, to try and bring that up to the snuff of uh, the, the more mainstream commercial material. The other, the thing that differentiates it enormously, I think, from the 19th century world is you still have primary sources left. Check your stopwatch. Right. Um, Irwin was doing fine this morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, he was. <laughs> we lost Shelley Moldoff this week, uh, mm, last oh, week. God. The, guy, the last guy who had work in Action One who was alive. Mm. Um, we're losing them pretty quick. And frankly, we're losing their memories and their minds faster than we're losing them personally. Right. Um, I was talking to maybe the same gal you were mentioning who was who's doing the thesis on women in comics uh, about going to talk to Marie Severin, mm -hmm. who is still alive and on Long Island and I think still with us mentally. I'm not, I'm not sure if anyone's heard more recently. Um, who worked in EC's offices as the, the only woman of artistic bent there, who was on staff at Marvel as the only woman artist there all those years. Right. She'd have some unique perspectives on something like this. Right. You got a minute, and I'm not shooting the particular gal who I was talking to before, I, but just to the field of scholarship in general, we're about to lose an enormous body of knowledge in the next decade. Right. The last surviving people who were part of all this process or who spoke extensively to the people who did, and we really have, we really have to get that knowledge down. Stan. Right. Yeah. Um, right. You know, they're, the memories are the memories are going already. Right. But we're going to lose the last we're going to lose the last shot any minute now, and mm. that's a very very rich primary body of information. Can I can and, I just I'll, yeah Jim, please John. It, it, it's it's actually just just to sort of um, double down on, on what Paul is saying. We were you know we were chatting about the you know the the, the good old days of the 1980s, um, and he he had said. Um, something that I didn't know, and then I was like, I like wrote it down, like, oh my God, this is so important, that, oh yeah, th that's when royalty payments started. And so that if you built, and now he, would, he didn't describe it this way, but if you built a brand and people bought more of your book, that meant more money coming to you. And I'm just like, oh wow, duh, right? And that, but, but that, also, that also sort of ch is changing how I'm beginning to think about this, you know, this project. So just like a five minute conversation, um, so we need to talk more, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, and so, it, and so yes, it's certainly true that, that we should go um, and, and talk to as many as possible. One of the problems you have in dealing with this field academically is that as opposed, I'd argue, to, to book publishing, right. which the business history of and sort of the broad history of was understood and, and written down and relatively stable. By the time you get to 19th century literature, publishing's been pretty similar for, I don't know, 100 or 150 years before that. I'm not yeah. enough an academic to draw the line more neatly. Mm -hmm. um, this business has gone through four product life cycles in, in 75 years mm -hmm. with utterly different business models, utterly different sort of rules of the game mm -hmm. that have dramatic effect on how all of this happened. And you need to understand how those things kind of synchronize and drive it. The kind of run that Chris had on X-Men, which generated the insightful notes that now have found a home at Columbia, was extraordinarily unlikely to have happened a generation before or generation since, in part because of changes in the business condition. Right. If the royalty structures had not come in place, despite the fact that he was the most commercial writer of our generation in comics, there would have been a hell of a lot better opportunities for him to do other things. He would have ended up as a novelist full time or mm -hmm. going off into some other medium. Um, 
<laughs> All these things connect as part of the story, and you really do need a very multidisciplinary approach in it. It's also the business schools right. on mm -hmm. some level, and right. uh, the business or business history. And I want to build on Paul on what, on what you're saying and ask the the entire panel uh, about the interactions between academics uh, and scholars within the academy and other institutions that I would that are either outside the academy or para academic. Uh, that, what, what I mean by that, by that schmancy word, is uh, things both like Comic Cons, which are a source of these things, and places like the MLA right. or other kinds of uh, scholarly institutions that are not within the, the purview of the academy directly. Right. right. So uh, I'm going to start with you, Paul. Uh, maybe talk about you have a story about Comic Con, yes, and then and then go that way yeah. uh, if that's okay. It may be. I mean, the story's being written right. as we go. We'll see where it develops from there, but a fair point, Chris. Um, I'll try to do this anecdote as quickly as I can. So 15, 20 years ago, I get a phone call from a professor named Randy Duncan down at Hendrickson State, mm -hmm. lovely man, who I knew from some years ago when he read an article <laughs> that I had written for the Comics Journal called A Call for Higher Criticism, asking for some of these academics to come in and pick apart the crap we were doing and tell us what we were doing <laughs> and where it fit, fit in the history. Uh, and Randy said, I want to run a one of these things, colloquia, symposium, or something on comics and popular culture down here at Hendrickson. DC going to give me some money? Uh, <laughs> that was exactly my answer. I kind of laughed pretty quickly. And then I said, no. seriously, Randy, Arkansas? Um, it's, it's a, I'm sure it's a lovely state. I've managed not to set foot there. Um, I think you're going to have a hard time getting people down there. Never mind that we're not sending you any money. <laughs> Why don't you call the guys who run the San Diego Comic Con? Because they're a not-for-profit and they need to do things educationally every now and then to justify their existence and see if they'll give you some rooms in the back room of the convention. Because really, they, they've got space they're not using and... This will help them justify their stuff to keep their tax status. And I think every professor would much rather be in San Diego in August than Arkansas in February. <laughs> Just a wild guess. Um, and I think that was one of my more useful contributions as a publisher over the years. It's been running, I don't know how many, like 15, 15 years, yeah. something like that. And I mean, it probably would have happened of its own course in some fashion or another if, had I not been the part of it. But I'm very proud of it, regardless. And, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's kind of a couple of different names attached to different pieces of it, that, and that starts getting into the politics of the different guys. But Right, yeah. right. Uh, so I'm going to so, switch to Jonathan and talk about the MLA, where politics has never, ever appeared at no, all. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, so um, the MLA is split into various groups or factions or whatever you want to describe them. Um, and so the, the MLA is the, is the Modern Language Association, which is the... Um, is the, the sort of umbrella group for all teachers of literature, whether literature in English and German and Spanish, what have you. Um, and so every year there's this, there's this huge conference and it rotates from city to city. Um, and you have annual meetings of you know, Shakespearean scholars, there's a Shakespearean group and, and Victorian scholars and African American scholars and what have you. And so there is now, as of three years ago, a, a discussion group in graphic narratives. Right, and part of what this means is that there is now reserved space at every MLA for um, panels on, you know, from different professors on um, on co some element of comics, right? Um, and I happen to serve on the board of the MLA discussion group, um, and we were able to invite Danny to come out to Seattle um, to be the moderator, to be the moderator, to be the respondent on our panel called the Material History of Spider-Man. And so, just <laughs> looking at 
you know, Spider-Man, it, it was the anniversary, and so we were looking at the evolution of Spider-Man. Um, and of course, this made it into the New York Times via a disparaging comment by Stanley Fish about, you know, looking through this year's MLA, I see that there's a, a panel on the material history of Spider-Man, and this is the kind of thing that used to get us into trouble. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and so, and so you know, it, there, there still is resistance from an older guard and from a different faction, um, but it's, it's, it's actually been quite fruitful um, serving on the board, and, 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 and one of the things you do, you have to do when you're, when you're part of, of an area is you have to collaborate with another area every year. A different area, and so it's quite interesting. Everyone's like, "Ooh, ooh, ooh, comics, comics, comics," and they're sort of reaching out. And we actually, and like, we're, we're, we were initially worried about, you know, sort of reaching out to like Shakespeareans. How about doing something about Sandman and comics and them laughing at us? Um, but instead, we've actually never had to reach out. It's always been some of the, the more established groups reaching to us, saying, "Oh my God, our students want what you're doing. Can we have a panel, you know, to tie in so that we can sort of?" I'm like. Sure, why not, <laughs> right? Um, and so, and so this, this is definitely a sign of, of sort of how, how things are going in the future, um, that you know, all the panels are well attended and, and, and people want more. And so, I mean, every year the comics presence at MLA grows and grows. And so I think it's a, it's a sign of, of, of health for, uh, for this intellectual project. Chris, are there other institutions uh, that you're thinking of that? Well, I, I, I'd like to, first of all, say something about what Paul said about retrieving our memories, and I want to do a little shout out to uh, <coughs> Charles Kochman and Abrams um, and their comics arts line, because mm, mm -hmm. um, they've been a, uh, uh, Charles has done a, an amazing job bringing out books about our great, oh, I'm sorry, about, about our great uh, writers. I got to, I had the honor of doing a book on Jerry Robinson, which was based on two years of interviews, and, um, but it's really tough to do a book like that. It is very hard to find a publisher that would be interested in doing a book on, you know, any of our great artists or writers. Um, they just will not publish it. Um, even in academic press, it's it's difficult. And if you want to do a book like that and you're a scholar, you have to somehow get a grant from, you know, the National Endowment for the Humanities or someone like that. And it's very tough to get those kind of grants because one of the problems that academia has, and again, this is what Marshall Erisman said to me, the students don't have the hierarchies in their heads anymore, but the institutions have hierarchies, mm -hmm. the academics have hierarchies, mm -hmm. and um, you know, even in the MLA, there's a, a comics discussion group, but as far as allowing material based on comics into panels on general topics like um, you know, autobiography or uh, you know, 20th century literature, those topics are not allowed in other panels. I, I think comics are still ghettoized in academia. It's hard to publish things on comics unless you're doing it with a specialty press. And again, McFarland and University Press of Mississippi both deserve our deep thanks for the publishing programs that they have. But it's just very hard to publish material like that because academia is still all about hierarchies. And I think, I, I think that as comic scholars, that's something that we have to resist as we build um, our scholarship on comics is uh, to incorporate those kind of hierarchies in our own works. I was reading uh, an anthology of articles on um, autobiographical comics recently, and one of the articles began with the sentence, since Art Spiegelman raised the level of the genre of funny animal comics with Mouse. Mm. And I was just horrified, and I said, no. You know, we accept this material for what it is. We are finding the value in this popular culture that was read by millions of people and created by adults for adults often. That's one of the great things Jerry told me. We wrote the comics for ourselves. We drew them for ourselves. You know, we have to try to resist the hierarchies that academia may impose on us as we do our own scholarship, you know, in, in comics. And, and we have to be the people that, you know, change that field. Um, if I can just uh, uh, lighten lighten that that message a little bit, um, <laughs> at the, uh, the this forthcoming the, the forthcoming MLA is going to be in Boston, and um, the, the the discussion group of which I'm a part is actually partnering with the MLA division on autobiography, biography, and life writing, and so there is going to be the like formal collaboration um, on a panel called Graphic Lives in Wartime. So, I mean, again, I think that what you're saying is true, but I think it's also less and less true. I mean, this is, they have a lot of clout, and again, they came to us and said, you know, the growth industry and, 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 and autobiography is in graphic, you know, these, these life stories people are, are telling with pictures. Can you, can we partner so that we can have a formal discussion about this? And we're like, sure, because they have more money than we do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I, think, so. I think what's clear is that we're in this period of transition, and I'd like to segue uh, into the final question because I want to allow some time for people to, to ask questions of their own and uh, to ask you guys about uh, your, for your advice 
on a transition that's taking place here as well within Columbia narrowly, and that's at the libraries. Mm. Uh, this conference, I think, is dedicated to uh, a real celebration of a moment of transition, really headed over by, by our Karen Green, um, in which, with the assistance and support of, of, of the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library and the library as a whole, um, we've really become interested in collecting. Uh, and as I said earlier in my introduction, this is one of uh, our functions in the academy is as a custodian, a preserver, and a canonizer. And so I ask you on Karen's behalf, even though she didn't put me up to this, for uh, advice, which is how do we, Columbia University in the city of New York, right, with the comic New York, how, what's our best way of going about archiving and collecting materials? What should we be thinking about uh, in, uh, this, in this function of our academic job? What are some of the factors we should be thinking about? Any advice for, for us? And by us, of course, I mean Karen. Right. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Jonathan, and then go around that way. Sure. sure. Um, well, I actually want to want to just make a point before I actually answer that question. Um, it's you know prior to Karen doing the heroic work that she's been doing, it's sort of ridiculous that um, you know comics are born in New York, and if you want to go to the archives, the arch the best archives are at are at Michigan State and Ohio State, right? This would this would be the equivalent of there being no film school in Los Angeles. Like, <laughs> huh? Like, how, could, how can that even be, right? And so I think that there is a space for, you know, a sort of interdisciplinary center of comic studies that should live in New York City because New York City is where the there is, right? And so I think that, you know, to ask the question of how to properly archive is, um, which I will get around to answering, um, <laughs> is, but is to, is to actually aim too low. Right, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's particularly because let, let's let's just use Columbia as a hypothetical. Um, <laughs> given that there are so many um, comics turned into films, mm -hmm. right, and so given that like the film school would would want a piece of this, right, given that there's a tremendous interest in art history, in English, in history, in Jewish studies because of the of the of the you know the the um, the pioneers in the field, it it should be fairly easy to one would think, given in the absence of hi of hierarchies and bureaucracy, to actually you know stop laughing. To, <laughs> but you would think, in the absence of of, of all these other competing interests, that, that it would it would sort of be a natural fit, you know. And gee, look, the in, the, the institution's expanding; they're building a whole new campus. What might go there? Um, so you know, you would you would think that um, you know, given the the the, the centrality of comics to our culture at the current moment and given this long New York history of it that you know there should be a New York institution that would do even more that would give that would invest in Karen even more power <laughs> <laughs> um, but to answer to, to answer your question I mean I think that um, I think it's a yes and model we have to take everything I mean we have to take the um, you know the microfiche and the 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 original art and the um, and the actual newspaper print that, it, that was printed on um, I mean there's so much out there you know that I mean that the archive can can just grow and grow and grow I mean at this point because it's so young and so burgeoning there should be almost no discrimination at all let's just take it all and figure out how to make sense of it you know that's what grad students are for, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did not say those words. No, I was, uh, I was Chris. <laughs> to any grad students, I apologize. <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm proud that a writer like Chris Claremont's papers are coming here, but um, mm -hmm. I know one of the things that the special collections at Columbia has done for a long time is collect illustration and care about illustration. Um, I know they have not only Arthur Rackham art, but his paint box, which came from his daughter. So uh, I, I would like to see artists donate their art um, to Columbia. I think that would help get the attention um, of uh, the art history department here, which actually has its own gallery. Um, and it would, it would, in a sense, fit with their collections um, because they, the collections here, I believe, care about the history of book illustration, the history of books, the history of illustration. Um, and although um, I don't think that artists who draw comics are, in fact, illustrators, I think they're collaborators with the writers in a, in a way that illustrators are not. Right. Um, but I think that that kind of artistic mission, um, as well as the literary mission, would be a way um, for the Columbia Library Special Collections to make a lot of sense out of comics in, in a way that they could understand and that would match up with their missions, and I'd like to see that happen. Right. Great. Paul, last word. Uh, stop us from throwing the stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> it, give it to me, give it to you me. You know, in, in all seriousness, <laughs> the extraordinary thing about Chris's donation in part is both the meticulousness with which he worked 
And the fact that he has it. Hmm? That's a very kind word. <laughs> <laughs> well, from, from my hackish perspective. Um, but also the fact that it survived. You know, to the extent that I ever do stuff in the fashion that, that Chris does in planning a story, it goes in the trash can five minutes later. And it has all, my whole career. Um, it, I'm, it still does this week. Uh, um, stop well, doing, stop but doing that. That becomes the question. If, if in fact there is going to be a real home for these things, then the comic book professionals and even the comic book publishing companies need to be educated as a first step that there is a, is a home that will take these children. I, I, hang on. I, I, a couple of real <laughs> practical steps to that. Warner Brothers understands that UCLA has a film archive that Warner Brothers gets to have some influence over and that will take essentially the outbox from Warner Brothers every day. And that stuff will go there. So an awful lot of stuff is preserved strictly because it's going to go somewhere where the studio isn't going to have to pay to keep it. Mm. Uh, and mm -hmm. they can go back and look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. DC, as a division of Warner Brothers, puts its stuff in the recycle bin because there is no archive for it to go to. <laughs> um, and DC did a much better job than Marvel did of preserving any kind of library of its material through the 50s. Before, before my time, right. I take no credit for this. Right. Um, I didn't throw it out, and I, and I kept it up when it was my turn. There's some library books with little library pocket cards pasted in them when I was 16 years old working as an assistant editor. Um, but you, you have to, as a first step, establish that this exists and that it is funded enough. When the Eisner archives went to Ohio State, they, in part, they went to Ohio State with Ohio State requiring a donation to sort them and manage them and take care of them, mm. to take custody of them. Um, you ha There's a whole art form which I don't pretend to understand, but that presumably Columbia has some great deep expertise on to figure out how to fund the people to go through Chris's stuff and organize it, grad students or whatever, I interns. Well, you <laughs> still got to feed them. You still got to keep <laughs> track of them. Um, the more you can set up an official welcome for this, mm -hmm. the more chance there will be for stuff to be turned over, and the more you can reach out er at early stages and say to the people who you're interested in, you know, we, we might like your stuff someday. Uh, and University of Wyoming has been very good at that for quite a number of years, you know, long before I had any rational thought of sending any anything anywhere. Uh, I had a letter from them saying, you know, before you die, can you just send us everything? Uh, not really thinking so, but okay. Um. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for some questions or comments. So uh, for posterity's sake, now that we've talked about collecting, please, uh, if you have a question, come up to the microphone, uh, and that way it will be sure to be heard by everybody, including the cameras. Yes. Start with Hi, I just want to say, one thing that was overlooked and when you gave credits for Paul, I believe you didn't mention his first credit should be, he was a chief executive at DC Comics for over 30 years and it was under his tutelage that he oversaw groundbreaking works like Dark Knight and Watchmen that really brought DC Comics into the modern era and I just think that has to be acknowledged for Paul. Appreciate it, but I overstated, Arlen. I was not, not the record the is so amended. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wasn't the head of the company in the years that we first published those books. I, I know you. Yeah, certainly was involved all those years, but uh, Jeanette Kahn was the the leading creative force in the company in those years. So let's not. I've done, I, I've done enough. I can stand. I can stand on my own list. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then my other comment, and this has to do with New York, is that, and this is no offense or at all the criticism of Will Eisner, but it seems to be common perception that he is the father of the graphic novel. The bottom line is, is that A Contract with God is a collection of short stories. And Jim Steranko, mm. who is a living legend, mm -hmm. created really the first intentional graphic novel in 1976 called Chandler. And for reasons that I'd like to hear maybe the three of you expound on, why Jim Steranko does not get the credit 
for really creating the first modern graphic novel two years before Eisner, um, I'd just like to hear your reaction to. Because I don't think he did. I'm an enormous fan of Jim's work, both as a historian and as a creator. Um, what makes Contract with God pivotal was Will's desire to have it published as literature right. and brought to the world. Right. Thank you. The fact that he turned down other forms of publishing, the fact that he co-funded some of the publishing with Baronet to get it out there, that he insisted on it coming out as a hardcover going into traditional bookstores. Many of those are things that Jim would certainly have wanted to do or tried to do as well. He simply didn't succeed in them at right. that point. Yeah. Um, that, as we heard in the earlier panel when you were talking, particularly the two young women who have come up in a much later era of the business than I have, who point to contract with God as their starting point, there have been long form comics for a long time. Chandler's an extraordinary piece of work, extraordinary in its courage at the time. Uh, McGregor and Rogers, Detectives Inc. at pretty much the same moment as Contract with God. And then there was Sabre by Galassi, and that was 78. Yeah. Yep, yeah. There, there's a number of pieces that come together in this trend. But when you go back, as I think, as a historian, and again, I'll defer to those with the degrees, the turning point becomes Will's work. Be right. And it's really, in many ways, his work as the evangelist of the graphic novel that is much more relevant than his work as the father of it. He, right. he did it by demonstrating what could be done. He did it by putting his money where his, his, where his mouth was uh, again and again. And uh, it's just it's an extraordinary... But I also think Eisner's work transcended the genre and it was the subject matter and the seriousness of it, whereas Steranko's was genre fiction set in New York City, a film noir graphic novel, and I think it was also the seriousness of the subject matter or, that gave Eisner the edge. Or lightning didn't strike there. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, so part of it is you just have to look back and say, what did actually happen? Right. right. Thank, Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, Danny? I think this uh, woman has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I had a question, but I think actually Jonathan answered it with his proposal. Um, so my question had to do with what about those of us who are in uh, fields that have not been mentioned that are themselves interdisciplinary mm -hmm. and that are beginning to make use of graphic novels extensively. And I teach in an area here at Columbia called narrative medicine. Mm -hmm. And in medical humanities, a lot of people are beginning to use right. graphic novels and right. they're wonderful narratives and mm -hmm. really, um, they're used in medical schools, they're used in our graduate programs. Um, but we don't have the resources typically. I mean, we pick Karen's brain all the time. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. an interdisciplinary center would actually let, let her off the hook a little bit or, right. and bring a lot more people in. And we would be able to access more of the literature, which we don't know not being scholars in the area. Right. Um, and we'd also get some training in how to close read a graphic novel. Right. What are you know the sort of fundamentals that you're all talking about? Right. Who are the, what are the seminal novels that we should know about and how do we look at them? Right. So, You've answered the question, but I just guess I want to let people know that there are others out there no, of course. who would really want to use this. There's a, there's, a, there's a scholar at Duke named Priscilla Wald who does a lot of yes. work, um, interdis interdisciplinary work on literary studies and on science as well. And like she and I have been in conversation in part because I'm like, hey, what, you know, what do you think of, like, of, of my cancer diaries, for example? And she's like, oh, I haven't really looked at that. I'm like, oh, well, here's. And so, um, I mean, again, in the absence of a place to host someone to have that discussion, you know, in the absence, you know, then it's just sort of like I can like share these three emails we've exchanged, right? But um, but you're right. I mean, and that's that's the other thing. As soon as you create a center, suddenly there are you know there are requests like that one, and then it's like, well, how do we do that? Oh, well, fine. We just invite Priscilla Wald from Duke, and we bring this other person from here, and then we have a discussion, and now we have a symposium, and now you're getting what you need, right? Again, this is why it's sort of. Are there any administrators here? Anyway, um, this is why it's sort of crazy that they're like in. I mean, it's, it's not just it's not just Columbia. I'm just happy to say this because I'm here. I mean, NYU, CUNY, Fordham, I mean, like, how can there be no place in New York? It doesn't make any sense, right? And so, um, yes, even for, for reasons that 
aren't even occurring to me as I'm saying it. You know, it's, this seems to be a natural thing that, that, that should eventually happen. D didn't Paul say comics were just one rung above pornography? Well, I, but I mean, there's I pornography think. studies too. Come on now. <laughs> but do they have their own Thanks. center yet? Um, I think <laughs> in, in, in the Valley in California. Uh, <laughs> Danny. Um, just to go back to your original question of what's missing in the world of uh, comics studies, um, as someone who teaches various aspects of comics history, how, you know how how to um, appreciation, the vo the vocabulary, and this is a problem that film studies had 25 right. years ago. Right. That still has is when you talk to students or other uh, other uh, academics uh, or about comics, it's almost always well, what is the story? Um, what mm -hmm. happens next? It's like reading a movie review that forgets that it's a visual medium. So right. what's right. missing, and I think it's connected to the histor historical and, uh, and preservationist aspect, is um, an appreciation of comics as a medium that is not, you know, it's, that is not a offshoot of film or an offshoot of the novel, but is sequential art or comics or whatever. Right. So I, I know it's a long struggle and film studies is still not there, but yeah. sort of is that being addressed or do you see that as happening or is it, or, or for the time being, is comics always gonna tag on to other departments? Um, for now, comics are always tagging on to other departments. I, I, you know, one of the problems with the disciplinary, you know, structure of academia is that I, I don't know of anyone um, except Hillary Shute at Chicago who has been hired primarily to teach comics. Right. Everyone else who has been hired, they do children's literature. If you like Tom Inge, you do Southern literature. Right. You know, no one has been hired primarily to teach comics. I do all popular culture at right. a couple of places that I teach, and it's just not considered to be something that you would hire a faculty member to do. That's one reason why we don't have the research we do, because there's no one to advise PhDs. Right. You know, in these things, it's not considered to be really a part of academia. Uh, I would like to say uh, art history is a discipline that really could contribute to comics, that I, I love my colleagues in literature who write about comics, but um, oftentimes they, you know, they haven't been trained in visual analysis, they don't know the history of art, and if you talk to any artist, if you talk to Chris Ware, they know the history of art backwards and forwards. They're yep. constantly referring to things, yep. you know, visually that, you know, um, um, American Impressionism is a major feature of Jimmy Corrigan, right. okay? And, right. and, you know, most people are just not going to know that because they don't know the history of art, right. you know? Uh, yeah. Persepolis, all of these books. Will Eisner was steeped um, in the Ashcan school. I mean, things, specific compositions taken from paintings of the Ashcan school appear in his graphic novels, you know, as well right. as Jewish theater and everything. In fact, to study comics, you need to know everything. Right. Okay? Well, and it's like, right. it's, it's, it's like studying film. I mean, do right. you think there's a timeline or a way to get comics to even the point where film studies are now? I mean, it's, it's, People study, people look at the same texts over and over and over again, and they do it for precisely this reason, right? Because, you know, the text has this to offer, it has that to offer, it has this other thing. Um, I mean, this is why, you know, an, an interdisciplinary an interdisciplinary approach that you know calls attention to the fact that there's no one way to actually get at this right is so important. Like one of the, one of the areas that that were uh, my my biggest frustration is the imposition of auteur theory onto comics, right? And so it's like, oh, this is Stan Lee's. This is not Stan Lee's. <laughs> this is Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's, right? And then followed by Stan Lee and 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 um, and, and John, John Romita's, followed by Stan Lee and and Stan Lee and or you know, Alan Moore, Alan Moore, really, Alan Moore didn't draw a thing, right? I mean, and I revere <laughs> Alan Moore, right? But you can't then, you can't start calling things Alan Moore's or Chris Claremont's without, you know, pointing to the, the collaboration, right? And so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I mean, so sure, on the, on the one hand, it, this is Art Spiegelman's. Right, Art Spiegelman has done every little thing, but you can't then apply that method of, of criticism to talk about Chris Claremont's X-Men because they're wonderful, but it's not just his, right? And so we have to then begin to form a new sort of vocabulary to, to discuss, and if, but the problem is th it exists in art, right? I mean, people don't necessarily understand that, for example, Tarantino has had the same cinematographer for all of his films. And his latest film, Django Unchained, which I'm terrified of, is, <laughs> is going to be the first film he does without that cinematographer, 
right? And so now, and so it's a film about slavery and it's a film that has all this, all this other stuff in it and it might fail as a film and people are gonna say, oh, Tarantino blew it, but could it possibly be that he didn't have this relationship that he already had? Right? Um, I mean, so anyway, so I mean, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to do, and that's just one area where you can sort of think, think things through very differently. One quick addition to Danny's uh, point on a timeline. As far as I've ever been able to tell, the first comics course taught at a college was Michael Uslan's at Indiana yeah. University in 72. Yep. Yep. So we're 40 years into somebody teaching a course in comics, <laughs> one place. You can now get a minor in it at the University of Oregon. You can get a master's in it at the Center for Cartoon Arts. University of Florida has a minor also. Yeah. Okay, so we, we got two. Um, still no departments, as the, the guys point out. I, I, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm strictly speaking about the US. It would shock me if there wasn't much more. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 are, there are places, but... but SCAD, SCADS, is, you're still in the practical. It's not comic, it's not comic studies. It's about right, learning exactly. to draw. You've, right. you've had that a number of places for a longer time. But at any rate, if it, it took us 40 years to get from one course to a minor in a couple of places, it's going to take a while. <laughs> um, but this is a great step forward, and I'm profoundly grateful to all the organizers for uh, making this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Well... Uh, I apologize, I see a couple of people uh, standing up here, but we're only going to have time for one more question, uh, and, then, and then I'm going to make some quick closing remarks. Uh, Eddie, I'm sorry, sir. Okay. Um, I, uh, I mean, obviously this is a you know, New York-centric conference, and we've talked a lot about American comics, but there's this great corpus of European, Japanese comics, uh, uh, almost all cultures have these, and um, no mention's been made of them. So I'm wondering where you'd situate uh, these traditions within the study of graphic novels and comics, you know, in courses. Um, in context, as best you can, right. that they exist. You try to introduce the breadth of it. I think to the point of being New York-centric, the first significant contact from the world of band dessinée to American comics was in 72, when a fan scholar named David Pascal brought a gathering of the great French bande dessinée artists to New York to introduce them to American comics and through a miniature convention for them to meet some of the American practitioners and American fans and we got to meet, I was reminded of this the other week when uh, Jean Giraud passed, having met him there when I was 15. Um, I know, right? This was the place you took them to because this was where it was, and those those links have existed for a long time. Uh, it's a there are very different traditions of comics elsewhere in the world. Um, some of them easy to connect, some of them more challenging to even as a non scholar begin to find a language for. Right. Uh, and maybe that's something where the interdisciplinary world can help because surely there are professors of world literature who have schemata for analyzing these things that right. us poor comic book people don't. It's just band destiny are different. Right. Um, and the kids here don't like it and we can't really sell it over here. <laughs> it's really cool though, but unless it's got naked women in it, it doesn't do too well. <laughs> um, oh. Right. I mean, I would, I, I would say that, you know, I mean, like one of the things, if, you know, if, I, if I ever get, get a good grant proposal together, one of the things, things that I wouldn't do is, is go to Paris and collect um, French language Arab comics. Mm -hmm. Right. There are there are a bunch of like sort of like protest counterculture comics being done by like Algerians and people living in the slums in France that doesn't ever get here because, you know, the French, I mean, the French are serious about their culture and they're not going to put something out and send it across the pond that, that, that sort of denigrates what it is to be French, right? <laughs> so this is like oppositional culture at work and it is sort of, you know, mm -hmm. it, it goes on, it, it's, it's red, but it does, it, you know, it goes unarchived, right? Um, but the other thing I would say is like, you know, my students always yell at me like, we need manga, we need manga. I'm like, do you read Japanese? <laughs> right? Because, because, you know, and, and you know, you begin to talk about all the problems of translation and transposition, like where they're putting the pages back to forward and they, and they mix pages up all the time. Why you don't think translation at 
five dollars a page is being done to the highest scholarly <laughs> standards. <laughs> exactly. Right. And so I mean, and so I mean, this this is it is a problem. But I mean, you know, I mean, I, I am going to do some sort of international work, but primarily, you know, there's enough, there's weight, there's more than enough work that, to be done in in the in the English language context, and hopefully, you know, others can build those bridges, and I'll put a brick in that when I get to Paris and start collecting those <laughs> comics. But you know, there's there's just there's just too much to be done. Um, you know? My comics courses are always international. I, I started teaching in a comparative literature department. It always has to be international, and I, right. I think comics are one of the great international dialogues. You know, Disney, Tezuka, Disney is really an important dialogue. Right. Um, right. Uh, uh, bringing up father to Hergé. Um, is an important international dialogue. Um, mm. The liberation of French comics in the 1970s was due to the American underground, you right. know, de Mobius, um, and that's how I teach comics. It's an international dialogue, both stylistically and narratively. You know, Superman to superheroes all over the world. I mean, yeah. Superman is really the, the icon, and, and that's the way it needs to be done. And uh, um, when I first started teaching comics in Complet, I said, you know, is it okay if my course is international? I want to cover Latin America as well as North America and Francophone Canada. And they said, of course, that's what we do in right. Complet. Right. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a dialogue, and you can teach it that way. Thank you, Chris. And uh, from the flights of international uh, activity, and Gabe, I'm going to bring things uh, a little bit closer to home to uh, make some quick closing remarks that I'm going to segue smoothly into right now, uh, and then they will be followed by, by a signing for our panelists. But first, let me thank these panelists uh, for, their, uh, for their wonderful work. And uh, the group before you to the left on the table is just the latest iteration of a tremendous amount of intellect, wit, charm, and imagination uh, that has been going on for the last two days. So all of our panelists and all of our moderators really uh, deserve a great, a great thanks uh, from all of us. Um, I want to single out just a couple of people and institutions for thank yous. This is what this part is. Uh, and um, you know, I'll, I'll be quick, but, but heartfelt as I possibly can. Uh, the first, uh, briefly, I mentioned this at the beginning of the panel, is to Chris Couch for the idea which started this all out. So Chris, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to now thank uh, my co-organizers, one by one. First, Danny Fingeroth. Uh, Danny. Danny's uh, passion and his, uh, his deep commitment and his intelligence and his respect for the people who, who have been in this field and this industry really just was evident, uh, you know, throughout the entire thing and, and it was wonderful working with you. Um, and it was uh, an, an equal pleasure uh, working with Karen Green. So first, Woo! Karen, everybody. Um, mm. If there was a word cloud of my comments over the last couple of days, the word indefatigable would have appeared uh, sort of in big, big letters. Uh, and that is because of Karen. And uh, every time I said, isn't it amazing? And I would say, yeah, Karen's work on this has been indefatigable. Uh, and really just the amount of energy and time and effort that she put in was as awe-inspiring as the work she's been doing for the last years in building up the collection is. She's a wonderful partner. Please, just one more round of applause for Karen. Yeah. Um, if you will turn to the back of your programs, you will see a list of institutions and individuals that have sponsored and made this happen. Please, as we would say in, in the Jewish world, take a look, think kindly of them. Uh, <laughs> they uh, really, this could not have done without them. I'll not mention them one by one, but that's what the program is for. Please think about them. Uh, if you meet any of them institutionally on the street, go up and thank them very much. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank the person who is now actually doing what I said and looking at the back, Chris Claremont. Uh, uh, Chris, if it wasn't for his generosity uh, and uh, his, his vision both as a creator and then as a donator, uh, we would not be able to uh, have this kind of celebratory uh, opportunity. Chris, it, it, it was incredible. it's been incredible getting to know you. It's incredible looking at your work both as a child and now in the rare book and manuscript library. Chris, thank you. Uh, and I will end on behalf of the university and the libraries with, a, with uh, I guess, a, what, what Paul might call a nudge and I would call a plea. Um, 
It, this is Columbia University in the city of New York. It's the Columbia University Libraries in the city of New York. And the reason that Chris's gift is so wonderful is not only for what it does on its own, it gives us a tremendous amount of knowledge and scholarship, but also as a catalyst for future people, many of the people who are represented on this table and the table all through the last two days, to donate their work, their time, and their treasures to us and to future generations of scholars 20 years from now, uh, if Karen and I are still doing this. Um, <laughs> we hope to have people say that Chris's gifts and others have been the basis of a renaissance of scholarly work. And so if you are someone who has these materials, if you know someone who has these materials, if you are willing to geshry someone who has these materials, <laughs> please, please do so. We here at the library have uh, and at the university have open hands, open hearts, and open ears to hear these kinds of opportunities. So please uh, uh, donate with wide, uh, with wide hands and an open heart. Thank you all very, very much. Oh. Thank you all. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Have a, it was great being with you for two days. Enjoy the signing and have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you.